If you want to make the best carbonated water, you simply can't crank your regulator up to 11 and force as much carbon dioxide into the water as you can get. Uh, the reality is there's two other factors that are actually more important than the PSI or the pressure you put into the water. And I'm going to show you both today along with a couple other tips to make the best carbonated water you can make. So let's get started. I'm Darcy O'Neill and this is Art of Drink. And since we're making carbonated water and we want it to be the best, the quality of our water is important. If you're in the city and you don't like the taste of the chlorine in your water, you can use a carbon filter, you can buy distilled water if you want, or you can use sodium ascorbate to remove chlorine or chloramine from your water source. And it's really simple. You need such a tiny amount of this that it's really hard to measure. But luckily it doesn't really have a, a much, it has a mildly salty, slightly sour flavor, but you would never notice it in the amount you're using, whether you're putting it in a liter of water or 800 mils, I believe those are, or a corny keg or a larger volume. Typically you only need about five milligrams per liter to neutralize the chlorine. This scoop is roughly 50 milligrams. So that's enough to treat 10 liters roughly of chlorinated water and two scoops of that into a corny keg is more than sufficient. So now that you have good tasting water, the next step is one of the two most important steps and that's removing entrained air. Now you'll often see it in beer videos where they're kegging something and they release the, the pressure in the keg and then they charge it up again and release it again to remove CO2 or actually air from the headspace. Now that does an okay job, but not a great job. It removes mostly the air in the headspace, but not dissolved in the liquid. Now here's why this is important. And it's that though air is only slightly soluble in water, 23 milligrams per liter, whereas carbon dioxide is soluble at zero degrees at 3,300 milligrams per liter, air displaces 50 times its own volume of carbon dioxide. So 23 milligrams of air dissolved in water will displace 1,150 milligrams of carbon dioxide or one third of your carbon dioxide level. Even if you could get 3,300 milligrams of carbon dioxide into the water, uh, the air is going to not allow it all to go in. So it's gonna remove one third of your carbon dioxide capacity. And that's actually a big deal when it comes to making really quality carbonated water. And it also has some side effects later on. So when you open the bottle, the rush of air trying to escape, especially if it's in the headspace, will force all the carbonation out. And that's why sometimes when you open a bottle and it degasses, you get a lot of, you end up with a flat drink. You really do want to remove that air. It, it's been known since the 1880s that removing air is very important. Uh, Joseph Gould talked about it. I talked about him in my last video. Uh, I'll put a link below uh, so you can read his book, but it really gives a good explanation. So how do you remove air? Simple, you boil it. And boiling, just bringing it up to the boiling point, you don't even have to let it boil for any length of time, will remove 100% of the entrained air. Even bringing it up to 90 degrees Celsius or 194 Fahrenheit will remove 90% of the air. That actually makes a huge difference. Just by doing that step, you can increase your carbonation capacity by one third. If you just want to do large volumes, obviously you don't want to use a kettle, just get a big old brew pot. And this will fill two corny kegs. So what you, what I do when I fill these is I just put in about eight gallons of water, bring it pretty much near to a boil, 90, 95 degrees Celsius or, you know, 200 Fahrenheit. And then what I do is add ice to this. So you'd basically take ice to chill it down so you don't have to wait overnight. If you have a bar and you burn your well to clean up, just take that ice and put it into the water. And as soon as it's cool, fill it into your corny kegs. Or in the case, what I do is if I'm just doing it for my soda stream, I just simply boil my water and then take some ice cubes 
when you freeze water, the air actually comes out of it and that's why it's partially cloudy. But if you just put it in the kettle, it will melt and cool your water much quicker. And so you can actually make a number of bottles. So if you have like 10 of these bottles, just boil up some water, fill each one with some chilled water. You don't want to put boiled water in these, but then just put them in the fridge or store them. Uh, one of the tricks is to actually, once you get these filled with this water before they get sloshed around or the air in the headspace uh, creates an equilibrium where some dissolves, just put it into your soda stream and just give it two blasts like psh, psh, and that will actually put carbon dioxide into the headspace, displace a lot of the air, cap it, and then just let it, let it sit in a cold place overnight. You wanna get this as cold as possible, and that's step number two. Getting your liquid as cold as possible before carbonation. So if you've got the water in here and it's ice cold, and I mean ice cold, zero degrees Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit is the perfect carbonation temperature. You can get 3,300 milligrams of carbon dioxide into it. Now, if you're a beer brewer, you know one volume of carbon dioxide, or volumes of carbon dioxide, is a measure of putting one liter of carbon dioxide into one liter of liquid. And that's done at NPT, normal pressure and temperature, which is 15 degrees Celsius, kind of, you know, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. And what happens is that that's two grams or 2000 milligrams of carbon dioxide being dissolved into one liter. At zero degrees, you get 3,300, which is well over 50% more carbon dioxide dissolved into the water at a colder temperature. So again, if you're looking at a 50% increase in the amount of carbon dioxide you can get into it, just because you're chilling it down, and even at four degrees Celsius, which is uh, fridge temperature, you're only, you're, there's a 15% loss of carbon dioxide capacity compared to zero degrees Celsius. So it's one of those things. If you really want to get it to that really cold temperature, you're gonna get really good carbonation. And those are the two important things, but here's a couple tips. The first one is, buy heavy glasses and stick them in the fridge. Chilled, clean, heavy glasses. First of all, uh, chilled makes a big difference because when you pour your carbon dioxide or your carbonated water into them, if they're warm, that's gonna warm up the first splash of water and then that's gonna cause a lot of cavitation and that's gonna remove some of your carbon dioxide. If they're heavy walled, then they will retain their temperature much longer. And that allows you to have a cold drink, obviously, for longer. Now, if you see here, this is a soda stream. This has been boiled, uh, carbonated at zero degrees Celsius. Actually, it's slightly below zero because I already have ice in there and it's been icy like this all day. But when you open it, you should get a little bit of a rush, but again, as you fill this, you'll find that the effervescence will continue. I talked about this in my last video, but it, this actually makes a big difference when it comes to that pungency people talk about. Now that's really carbonated and that's only 15 PSI. So soda streams only, I think they're actually 12 PSI. So not near the carbonation levels we talked about at old soda fountains, which though they charged at 150 PSI, the actual drink PSI was probably closer to 40, maybe 60 on a good day. But the idea is that if you have air entrainment and warm water, you're never ever going to get good carbonation. Now the last tip is that ice is your enemy. Camper English may be a big fan of ice and it's great for cocktails, I will say that. But when it comes to putting it in a drink with carbonated water, it causes too many nucleation points and that will cause a lot of carbon dioxide to evolve quicker. And it doesn't really benefit the water much. It may keep it cold on a really hot day, but the ice does cause carbonated water to go flat fairly quickly because you'll see a lot of bubbles coming out 
And this is just a nice set, steady stream. So it's kind of why they don't put ice in champagne. It just, you know, kind of ruins the whole thing. So at the soda fountain, they'd actually rarely ever put ice in drinks. If they did, they'd put a little float of it, crushed ice on top. But for the most part, they would always use ice just to chill things, whether that's the syrups or the carbonation vessel or the glassware. That's basically it. Deaerate your water by boiling it. Make sure it's ice cold when you carbonate it, whether that's in a keg or soda stream. And then, you know, use cold glasses. Heavy glasses are better. And also don't use ice. Uh, that will make all the difference if you're just using a simple setup. It'll also make a big difference if you're putting this on tap. So when we get to that in the next video where we start talking about larger volumes and forced carbonation and getting up to pressures of 60 PSI, the deaeration or pneumatic waters are going to make a difference. And this idea of ice cold water is going to make a bigger difference. Take those tips as you see, but give it a try. You'll find you get much better water out of it. So thanks for watching. I will see you in the next one.